So ease of doing business gets a lot of attention, and, I'm, and, I, and, I, and I think it's an important model. I think every model in the world, like all of us know, is, not, is incomplete and not perfect, but it is useful. And I think the ease of doing business variables are under, under there are 24 of them related to labor laws. My case is that we, these are all important. You know, should we amend section two for redundancy? Should we allow third party notification? So everything around redundancy, but should we amend Factories Act? No, we should just make Factories Act redundant. Should we amend the probationary period? No, because we've already amended the Apprenticeship Act and allowed 10% of employees to be apprentices. So my submission is from political, I'm not saying these don't need to be done. I think putting them at the front phase will be a mistake. But there's so much else to be done. There are 44 labor laws which can be classified into five labor codes. That's already been documented by the third national labor, second national labor commission in 2003. And it would be very simple to do that where you would share a definition of wages. Today we have 17 definitions of wages. Where you would share a definition of workers. Today we have 22 definitions of workers. These, these frictional costs add a lot of problems in the ease of doing business. I think that they would be nice to touch the Industrial Disputes Act. You know, 25G and 25H of the Industrial Disputes Act say when you fire people, you have to fire the younger people before you fire the older people. And it's, it's kind of stupid, and I think the optics of changing that are good. So we should change that to say that, okay, we get rid of this apartheid between younger people and older people, and I think there's some appetite just to signal that we're not leaving the Industrial Disputes Act alone, but we don't. And by the way, you know, Industrial Disputes Act amendment is exactly what Rajasthan did, exactly what Maharashtra is doing. So we're not, we're raising the threshold from 100 to 300 in some states, some places are considering 500. I'm just saying this should not be done at the center. The plumbing and license using the same PAN, using a PAN number, today you get seven different numbers, almost sometimes nine as an employer, and you have to keep sort of, uh, they're not connected using the same, using the portal for the inspection regime. I don't know whether you followed that three months ago. Uh, an inspection regime was revamped where now an inspector can't go to an employ employer unless his name is randomly thrown up from the system and he has to file the inspection report within two days and if you don't file it within two days that inspection is considered done and without any observations. You know, these are, these are small plumbing items which do make a huge difference. They're not very interesting in the, in the, in the short run but in the long run it's, it, it makes a huge difference to the ease of doing business. So, Online approvals linked to pink. There is a Madhya Pradesh has proposed a 30-day automatic approval for all labor laws. Today you have to take 24. If you file and you don't hear back, you get 30-day automatic approval, which is possibly a great idea. And they identified the four which were most frequent, which was electronic record processing, which was women working at night, and seven-day working, which they proposed to give automatic approval for. You will have to apply, but it will be automatic approval. The fixed term contracts is an important one, and I only put that because, you know, Vajpayee government had put that in the standing orders, which, and it will take care of a lot of the redundancy rules, where today a fixed term contract is prohibited, where you can't tell somebody you start for, with me for six months and, or nine months and a fixed term. So re, just amending a few acts, this stupid 240 days and 182 days, which are ghosts in everybody's minds, which create a whole new industry, if you reintroduce fixed term contracts, you actually may be able to defer some of the decision making and difficult stuff on the other stuff. So, you know, I'm going to quickly cover skills because you already know this, but just the context of skills because the three E's of education, employment, and employability are much more closely related than we traditionally thought. And I would submit one of the reasons that we've had massive talk on skills but not that much output is because you haven't thought of the situation as a horizontal. So what have we learned? There is a matching problem which is connecting demand to supply, there's a mismatch problem which is repairing supply for demand, and there's a pipeline problem which is preparing. Repair and prepare, I distinguish between the opening balance of the child or the duration of the kid. But these three problems are much more closely related than we thought. There is a market failure in skills. Employers are not willing to pay for training your candidates, but they're willing to pay for trained candidates. Candidates are not willing to pay for training, they're willing to pay for a job. Banks for microfinance aren't willing to lend to candidates unless a job is guaranteed. And training companies aren't able to fill up their classrooms. So the innovation is at the intersection of employment and employability. Employers can't manufacture their own employees. You know, Gary Becker got the Nobel Prize for this. There are three holes in the bucket. You pay for training, the kid doesn't get a job. You pay for training, the kid gets a job but is not productive. You pay for training, the kid gets a job, is productive, but he leaves. So learning risk, attrition risk, and productivity risk means there's no fiscal model for employers to manufacture their own employees. I think degrees matter. Now we can, we can talk about, I know that you know, the UK Minister of Vocational Training recently said vocational training is for other people's children, not my children. 
and she was sort of paraphrasing what a lot when a lot of patronizing people give advice ki bhai degree ke piche kyon bhag rahe ho naukri ke piche bhago and all that i mean we have to make peace with the fact that degrees matter to people i mean it's it's learning has two values the social signaling value and the learning value i i went to wharton for my mba wharton is a good place to be at it's a better place to be from <laughs> and that's true for iits and iims and that may be the primary value of that education it's important to recognize that signaling value matters a lot in 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 the search cost for labor markets for which you know peter diamond got the nobel prize a few years ago signaling value is probably the only way you really reduce search costs a cost quality and scale are the impossible trinity we can get two out of three we can get one out of three probably we can't get three out of three so it's sort of delusional to think of that and that's really because the only way we're getting quality in india in the past is by tight entry gates so iits and iims have tight entry gates and wide open exit gates the other way to create signaling value is the chartered accountant exam which has wide open entry gates but tight exit gates vocational training has had wide open entry gates and wide open exit gates therefore um you clearly have not created signaling value and but is that a problem you know the regulatory thought world we only have 32000 doctors a year but we have 15 lakh engineers a year yeah i know we have 30% of those engineering seats are empty and another 30% of engineers are not really engineers but you know in a society i think we have to be careful of what john gardner he was an education secretary in the 1960s he asked can we be equal and excellent now these are inherent tensions in public policy we we want to be equal so we want to expand capacity but it's highly unlikely that we can be excellent at the same time so the three policy intersection the two policy intersections of vertical ministries and state versus center are obviously being mill managed you can go to an iti principal or you can go to ncvt in delhi or in the ministry of labor who says my strategy is perfect the states are screwing up execution while you can go to an iti in jaipur the same day and say well what are you doing he says well i'm i still required to teach automobile engineering with a carburetor no indian car has a carburetor <laughs> i'm still required to buy a dc fan i mean in, every time i go to the market to buy a dc fan that guy asks me iti mein kaam karte kya because clearly nobody else is buying a dc fan so if you're your so but that's the problem with the policy that we have sort of mismanaged so what do we need to do i think the agenda is quite clear the most important one is we need to convert the right to education act to the right to learning act because the right to education act bans exams before class 8 it requires you to um it confuses school buildings with building schools that it 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 obsesses with three variables teacher salaries teacher qualifications and small class sizes all three of which globally have no connection with learning outcomes in a material way so so thinking about the right to education which is fighting the enrollment war we're already at 100% enrollment versus fighting the learning outcome war and we're clear you can't teach people in 6 months what they should have learned in 12 years so it's important apprenticeships taking the current number of 3 lakhs which is bumped up to 4 lakhs but taking that to 10 million is eminently possible in the next 5 years and so learning by doing and learning while earning becomes an important vehicle which i think will take off the 1200 employment exchanges last year to the four crore people registered they only gave 3 lakh jobs um, converting them to career centers and making them more effective at just the pure matching function which is the lowest hanging fruit i think english is a vocational skill it's english is like windows I don't think we need to get sentimental about it. Obviously, there's a political economy question of English, but I think the case for English is really bilingualism. It's not really one language or the other. You know, Firaz Gorakhpuri and Harivan Shray Bachchan were great poets of Hindi and Urdu. Both were professors of English literature at Allahabad University. So it's important to recognize the sense, the emotion. Language is an emotional subject, and I completely agree with Ram Goa when he says that the way we handle language after independence is why we had different destinies than Pakistan and Sri Lanka. But uh, but English is. now increasingly a 300% wage premium um at at, at a, a migrant from up and bihar gets 6000 rupees with me as a packer loader while a migrant from the northeast will get 15 to 18000 because they join the front office so an unintended consequence of the baptist going to the northeast is a wage premium but it's clear that it's it's like windows it's an operating system massifying higher education now what does that mean See, college isn't where it used to be globally. 31% of retail sales clerks in the U.S. now have a college degree. That used to be 1% in 1970. 60% of taxi drivers in Korea now have a college degree. That used to be 1% in 1970. 15% of Group Four security guards in India now have a college degree. So, college isn't what it used to be. We don't need to get overly sentimental about it. So, we need to expand the two worlds of quantity and quality. And so, we need to create the connectivity between a three-month certificate, one-year diploma, two-year associate degree, and three-year degree. we need to have 
an online framework and a distance education framework. We need to give credit for apprentices and we need to have vocational universities. What is a vocational university? Three differences. It prays to one God, which is employers. A traditional university has 100% of the students on campus. A vocational university will only have 10% of the students on campus, the balance in apprenticeship programs and doing distance education or employer training programs. And in traditional university, 100% of the kids are pursuing a degree, while in a vocational university, only 20% at any point in time will be pursuing a degree. The rest will be working in a certain certificate diploma framework to go up to a degree. So you really massify education and think about it differently. You get the state intersections going. You figure out PPPs. You know, the government has an execution deficit, the private sector has a trust deficit, and not-for-profits have a scale deficit. But we need all three to work together. And that will only happen if you're going to figure out how to link poverty programs to skills. So NREGS, we spent two lakh crores. We could possibly have spent it differently. So I'm going to close with this slide with another one. but. You know, the enterprise geography of work is about GST, it is about tax simplification, and of course it is about ease of doing business variables. The sectoral geography of work is important to think about in terms of make in India. The physical geography of work is really the urbanization agenda. And, I, and I, you've got to think about this. I had a, I had a kid in a job fair in, in Gwalior some months ago who said, give me 4,000 rupees in Gwalior, 6,000 rupees in Gurugaon, 9,000 rupees in Delhi, and 18,000 rupees in Bombay. My bags are packed, now tell me where you want me to go. I said, why do you need four times more money to go to Bombay from here? He said, jitne bache 10,000 mein gaye the, sab wapas a gaye. Khana, rehna, aur office jana, ab nahi banta 10,000 mein. You know, living, eating, and commuting is, is the divergence between real wages and nominal wages. But that is the problem. We can't have that migration stop, so whether we create new cities, it's not shoving more people in Bombay, but the physical geography of work is urbanization. This is the three reboot, and this is the labor laws. I only put this slide up because people tend to think about jobs as sort of labor. If you don't get the horizontals right, job creation is sort of a synthesis of all these. So in conclusion, I, you know, when I landed in the US in 94, there was a front page article in the Wall Street Journal, which I've cut out and kept, where he said that India is more interesting than important. I hope that journalist is eating the newspaper on which he wrote that, because clearly what's happening in India is not once in a decade or once in a millennium. It's really once in the lifetime of a country. And, but we have to be careful from my vantage point, the 300 million people who will never read the newspaper that they deliver or drive the tractor that they unload or send their kids to the school that they help build. But this is not a problem like cancer or climate change. You know, this is an, this is a, uh, this is an execution problem. And, and, I, and I put formal job because a formal job as distinct from a job changes a life in a way that a subsidy never does. And it changes life in a way that an informal job does not. India is, does not have a problem with job creation. The 4% un unemployment number is not a fudge. I've gone deep into that. It is not a fudge. But we're not creating the kind of jobs which allow you to pull out of working poor. Those are two different problems. You know, when you say we're not creating jobs, we are. We're just not creating any formal jobs. And that sort of puts you firmly in the realm of, of how does the state become more adventurous? I mean, we need a more adventurous state. I remember Margaret Thatcher had this cabinet minister who used to keep appointing committees, keep writing reports, but never get anything done. You know? So she turned to him in a cabinet meeting and she said, John, you know what your problem is? Your brain is not attached to your backbone. And if you, if you think about the last government, that was partly true, right? Because they were very intelligent people who knew exactly what to do, but you just got nothing done. And I'm not, it's, it's not about particular personalities. It's a way of thinking about policy which you can't sort of unpack from, from politics. I, I, I think that's, that's, that's key to thinking about sort of labor reforms in my mind. What I have learned is that the more you give it to the states, the more you focus on plumbing, the more specific you make it, the more progress you will make. There are nine states now which have submitted their plans for labor reforms to the MHA which handles that, that particular section. And I think there are another six more who are considering. For making India to work, I know Swami in the morning felt it's not, it's not specific enough. I don't know what, what will be more, spe do you make, do you think about making India and improving the entire horizontal which is the GST and the, and the urbanization and labor laws and the seven things? Or do you view making India as subsidies to light industrial manufacturing or, or, or telecom? I, I, I think right now the view seems to be that let's just focus on the horizontals because job creation is sort of spontaneous combustion. We don't know uh, where it will happen. We don't know how it will happen. And if states like, or for example, Rajasthan, Bhiwadi becomes, is, is very competitive with Gurgaon, they 
have an incentive to do what they have. So the more local you get. So obviously 29 chief ministers matter. I think 100 mayors matter more than 29 chief ministers. In 1924, Vallabhai Patel was the mayor of Ahmedabad, Jawaharlal Nehru was the mayor of Allahabad, Chitranjan Nas was the mayor of Calcutta, and Rajin Prasad was the mayor of Patna. And the wonderful letters I have of Rajin Prasad beating up teachers for absenteeism and Vallabhai Patel about sewage and Jawaharlal Nehru about street lights. You know, he, was, he used to obsess about street lights. Now, those kind of local issues are exactly what, what happens. If you, if you see, there's only one real mayor in India, that's the chief minister of Delhi. And which is why you see that election fought on very different terms than, than other places fought. So while we won't get to the mayor level um, in the immediate term, I think the decentralization for labor laws, this is an important sort of long-term impact.